offering digital product, project based learning uh, for K-12 math and science. Um, I'm Doug Cavillage with McGraw-Hill Education. I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. The webinar, as you know, is being presented in listen-only mode, which means um, you're only able to hear the presenters, and they're not able to, but they're not able to hear you. However, that doesn't mean you can't participate. Uh, we want to hear any questions or comments you have, so just type those into the questions portion of the, the GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, and we've got some polls today for you to interact with our presenter. Um, joining us today is Jenny McGuira. Uh, she's the Digital Learning Coordinator for the Academy for Urban School Leadership, a network of 29 neighborhood Chicago public schools. Previously, Jenny was a fourth and fifth grade math teacher and a math technology coach in Chicago public schools. Her education includes a BA in psychology and history from Columbia University, as well as an MST in mathematics education from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, some of her many accolades are Apple Distinguished Educator, Google Certified Teacher, and Chicago Public Schools 2012 Tech Innovator of the Year. Jenny, always a pleasure to have you, and welcome. Thank you, Doug, and I'm also super excited. This is our last uh, webinar of the series. This is 4 of 4, um, and I'm really excited to, because for this last one, we wanted to make it special, so we brought on um, a really good friend and colleague of mine, Ben Kovacs, who is an amazing sixth grade teacher from the Burley School on the northwest side of Chicago. He's a one-to-one -one iPad teacher. He's a one-to-watch with Chicago Public Schools. He's an incredible educator. I, it's, his classroom is one of the most student-centered and thoughtful classrooms I've ever been in. Um, I, I was, I've worked with Ben for a long time, but I finally got to see him teach recently, and I left crying, crying because I was so inspired and crying because I was super depressed that he didn't work in one of my schools. Um, so, uh, Ben, thank you so much for being on with us today. I, uh, it is quite my pleasure to be here, um, having taught, as, as you said, the Burley School, and you're crying. It sounds like I work at a very bougie place. Um, but dropping the the, it is a great uh, school to work with, and luckily I get to work with people like you, Jenny. So I am happy to be here today. Yay! So um, Ben does a ton with project-based learning in his classroom. Um, as a classroom teacher, I did uh, PBL as well. Um, so as we kick off today, we just want to first start by clarifying what project-based learning means. And it means really different things to really to different people. Um, ben, like, when did you first start digging into PBL, and, and what was your first impression of it, like right at the very beginning? Well, it started when I, actually, when I was just brand new as a third grade teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and so, of course, as a brand new teacher, project-based learning meant um, having kids um, do gifted and talented <laughs> activities. <laughs> and so, definitely, it was something that, um, you know, in, in the best essence, it let kids sort of drive their learning and uh, it engaged them in the material. In, in Uh-oh. That's were good. But of course, there was a lot of other um, pieces that needed to be revised and slowly over time, uh, the project-based learning that I've been doing with my sixth graders for a long time now is centered more on inquiry and um, the authenticity piece comes from within them and not necessarily from something that's scripted. And so, um, you know, I'm still learning a lot about it uh, all the time. And that's so funny, but I mean, I think a lot of people hear project-based learning, and the only word they hear is project. So people say, oh, yeah, I do PBL all the time. My kids made a poster about our ancient Egypt project. <laughs> um, and, and not to belittle that, I mean, obviously, any kind of creation is great. But project-based learning in its essence, and again, you know, there's lots of different interpretations. But the one that we're going to talk about today is, like Ben said, it's all about student agency and authentic learning. So it's not so much about doing a scripted project for the sake of creating a project. The idea of project-based learning is that authentic curiosity and coming up with a real problem. You also hear project-based learning called problem-based learning or challenge-based learning, and usually they're the same thing. But all of them, um, when you get to the real heart of it, is about starting with an authentic curiosity or problem, and then the whole thing digs around solving that problem or addressing it. So it's not just about making a paper mache mask or making a poster or a foldable. foldable. It's about real-world inquiry. And so that's what we really want to dig into today. 
And so uh, before we go on, I just wanted to do a quick poll to see um, if anyone else, um, and also I'm, I'm getting Paul, Paul saying that he hears intro music. Um, can you guys just in the questions let me know if you're hearing um, music as well? If so, well, I, I'm not here. Are you hearing music then? I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry about that, Paul. So he's hearing intro music and he wants it to stop. So if anyone else is hearing music, can you just let us know? Okay, so no one else is hearing music. Lots of people are saying no. So Paul, I don't know if you have another tab open, but um, sorry, I don't think it's us. Um, unfortunately, maybe next time we should have music. But I just want to do a quick poll to see if anyone here has um, has done any project-based learning before. Um, and you know, you can again um, call that whatever you want to. Ben's at school right now. Ben lives at Burley, so he's been at school. I'm buddy. sorry, everybody. Sorry about you, that bell. That's just again, it's making it authentic. You're gonna hear lots of school noises. <laughs> um, school hasn't started yet for our kids or teachers, but for Ben, school never stops. Mm. Um, so I think uh, it looks like 78 percent of you have voted. It looks like we're around 50 50. I'm just gonna give it a few more moments to see how many of you have dug into PBL in the past. And again, you can interpret that however you so choose. All right, we're just going to try and get to the 90. We're at 87%. We're almost there. Let's see how many people are just uh, really actively listening then, and how many of us have us open in a tab and are like checking their email. <laughs> you got you got to multitask sometimes. I know we're teachers. You got to do it. All right, we're right there. So it looks like 42% uh, of you have um, have used project-based learning, but the majority, 58%, have not. Uh, dig it. Love math. Love it when it adds up to 100%. So. Um, uh, looks like we're right about 50-50. So hopefully today, for those of you who have it, it really opens your eyes. And for those of you who do, it gives you some fresh ideas. I also want to address um, in the questions right at the beginning, someone had asked if um, Ramona was asking about whether or not this is going to be directed at any high school teacher. She teaches AP Physics and Calc. And while our examples aren't directly high school related, a lot of it are extendable. I know that Ben's uh, project-based learning unit that he did, you could definitely do with high schoolers a lot of mine as well. So um, don't worry about, um, about the grade level. We definitely think that this is extendable from pre-K through even post-grad. And we'll definitely talk about extensions. Please continue to ask questions um, and, and challenge us. So with that being said, we're going to dig into our first example. So um, when I first started doing project-based learning, uh, the first thing I thought about was junior achievement. Um, did, you, did you do junior achievement when you were in grade school, Ben? <laughs> yes, I did. And <laughs> even I had a junior achievement program uh, my first year teaching nine years ago. Um, which we, was... still have, we still have junior achievement like now in our school. <laughs> Um, and, you know, junior achievement's not a bad thing. I mean, it's trying to get kids to authentically think about business. Some of it's a little bit more authentic than others. But I remember that when I did junior achievement way back when, we had to create our own business. And um, we had to develop a business, create a business plan, but it was a little bit inauthentic because it was in this vacuum, right? Did you ever do anything like that in your GAA classes? Um, in my GAA classes? Oh, oh just GAA. didn't. No, in your oh, junior achievement junior classes. Achievement. Yeah, a little bit about businesses and just like managing money and, and thinking about like the role that money plays in our lives, a bit of balancing check, checkbooks, things like that, like trying to bring that wor real world application of math into the classroom, I think was the primary focus at the third grade level. Yeah, I, um, I, I think I did it when I was a fifth grader. And so what they wanted us to do is create our own business. And again, uh, kind of cool, but it's an authentic, inauthentic moment. It's sort of like when you read a word problem about a kid who looks and sounds like you and likes cookies. And, you know, if he eats six cookies, how much will it cost? And you're like, who eats six cookies? Um, you know, my mom would cut me off and then I'd have a stomach ache. So uh, what we started doing um, this year with one of our classrooms was having them partner with real businesses. So we took that idea that Junior Achievement has, which is like, you know, start your own business, which is somewhat inauthentic for a third or fourth grader, but instead have them work with a real business to help them um, with the level of abilities that they have. Um, Jackie just asked if these projects are going to work well with Common Core, and we're Common Core, you know, Chicago Public, we got to do Common Core, like, you know, the rest of Illinois. And so we 
were thinking a lot about our math, um, our math standards, our ELA standards, our persuasive writing. So um, we worked with local small businesses. Loretta's Bake Shop and Cafe is here in the West Loop. Um, it's one that we hope to reach out to this year. Uh, one of our students um, identified it as a, as a as a company that they want to work with, and they um, the kids have to do things like think um, about purchasing. So as this bake shop, where do they purchase their supplies from? How much does it cost? What are they pricing their cookies at? How much will people pay for a cookie? If they raise their cookies by 25 cents for each chocolate chip cookie, is it going to impact uh, product sales? But how much, uh, how much benefit or uh, revenue will that increase over time? They have to think about rents and how much it costs to power their um, power their place of business. So they're looking at live ComEd bills. They're looking at the rent and the cost of living for um, <laughs> for that area. So they're thinking, you know, West Loop of Chicago is a really great place to have a bakery. There's a ton of foot traffic, but is the cost of renting this um, this space? Um, making sense for the amount of foot traffic. If they move to a slightly cheaper neighborhood, is that going to impact their business? And, and so they're doing a lot of graphing. Um, they're having to think about marketing, like the ads that they're going to do. Should they create a television spot? Is that worth the money? Um, and they're developing all of this using um, digital tools. So they're creating Google Spreadsheets, which is like the Google version of Excel. They're creating presentations um, on Google Slides. They're creating iMovies. Um, uh, trailers and commercials using the iPad app, and they're developing it all for a business that they care about. So they're selecting the business based on something in their neighborhood that they want to help, that they might see as a struggling business. Um, some of the kids are doing um, neighborhood stores that they want to help improve their business and they don't shut down. Um, some of the kids are looking at after school programs and outreach. But it's really interesting to see them, see how the businesses react too to when a bunch of eight-year-olds say, hey, we want to help you with our business plan. I mean, it's good marketing for them, but it's also um, really great to see the kids in, get involved in their community and helping sustain local businesses. Um, I feel like, sorry, Jenny, just to yeah, interject yeah. there, I feel like just the whole task of identifying which variables um, are costs and, and in what ways they can increase their profits asks students to, to engage in math in a different way, right? And so with this project-based learning experience of them wanting to run their own businesses and, and thinking about that authentically, they also have to think about the math authentically. There's not, not ever going to necessarily be uh, a finite number of variables for them to consider when they're making their budget, but the ones that they do consider, the ones that they, they're broached with, then can become like wildfire, right? So if this group is working with this business model and this group is working with this business model, of course they're going to have shared expenses when it comes to electric, like uh, when you share that ComEd bill. But then what costs are like specialized for this industry and, and in what ways does does the math and science um, relate to that industry in particular? So uh, it feels like it could become this like creative beast that changes and grows and, and ebbs because of the students and what they imagine for their uh, business as well. I agree, and I also think that you brought up a good point with the ComEd is, you know, you can also see this is a cross-integration unit. So you heard me mention, like, math, common core, standard science, or, uh, sorry, ELA and math, but also there's science. I mean, they're looking at the kilowatts. They're looking at um, what, what do you measure electricity in, what can you do to reduce your elect electrical impact, your carbon footprints. And so whether you're teaching, um, you know, a 10th grade uh, math class, you know, or, you know, ninth grade algebra, or you're teaching fifth grade, um, you definitely work either whether you're self-contained or with other departmentalized teachers to make this a cross-discipline unit. And the best project-based learning units are cross-discipline. It's not like, we're only doing math. You don't do just math in life. You know, you're living, you're, you know, existing in all disciplines. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you're working in concert. Now, I understand that not all teachers are ready. So if you're wanting to do project-based and not all your colleagues are ready to rock and roll, I mean, maybe you're going to have to start on your own, but, you know, even as the math teacher, you can do a little writing, you can do a little bit of science, it's totally fine to do. I mean, Ben, do you work, I know your department, are you, you're somewhat departmentalized, right? We just transitioned for science and social studies, but it's, it's uh, mostly self-contained in sixth grade, although um, it's departmental in seventh and eighth grade. Um, that being said, like, it, like any good idea, of course I want to share it with my teaching partners, so the best opportunities happen when our kids can collaborate 
with each other across the classroom, so even when they're not physically present. Larry actually asked why Google and not Excel, and I think one reason to use the Google tool is because of that power of collaboration, where kids can create a shared budget template uh, that you were that you were using there, um, and so that even whether whether they're in that physical classroom, outside that physical classroom, or whether it bleeds into and crosses over um, into an interdisciplinary unit, uh, those things can exist in multiple places. And um, you're going to see in Ben's in Ben's uh, unit too. The brainstorming process of this is one of the most powerful. Having them identify that what problem or project they want to work on. So having the kids like go through the Google Map and determine which businesses they wanted to reach out to and partner. They used a Google Doc where they could all collaboratively type up the ideas and then vote on them by you know commenting and giving their feedback. That was really powerful. And you wouldn't be able to do that with a Microsoft product like Word or Excel. Micah and King also shared a really great, she teaches 10th grade at Econ, and um, her kids saw vacant spaces in their downtown, and they created a business plan to propose to the DDA, and she said it really inspired her kids. Um, it didn't work so much with high school Common Core, but it worked for Econ, and I would even say that I'm sure, you know how the age-old adage of, like, you can make the standards fit whatever you need it to? Um, I'm sure that, you know, you could definitely find ways to pull in some, some Common Core math goodness there as well. Um, and, you know, Megan also asked what iPad app did they use to make the commercials. My kids used iMovie. It's my favorite movie making app for any device. Sadly, iMovie doesn't work on <laughs> Android or Chromebook. But, um, you know, Mac or iPad, iMovie is, is worth its weight in gold. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, luckily I've had that opportunity to work with MacBooks in the past and with iPads. And iMovie just is, lets the kids seamlessly edit their, their video so that it becomes... Um, it looks like an authentic advertisement, and with all of this project-based learning, that authenticity piece is really critical. So when you can use some publishing software like that, I, it's ideal. Um, and Kristen asked a great question. Um, she it looks like she has old hat with PBL because she's using phrases like guiding questions. So she's asking, what's the guiding question for the students? And so with project-based challenge based or problem-based learning, usually you start with that essential question and then you have guiding questions that help you think about it. So for this particular business um, unit, our essential question was how can we support our community? Um, it started with, you know, my, a lot of my students, um, I work with 32 schools and the one common denominator with all 32 schools is they're in really struggling communities in Chicago. And um, so the question was how can we support our community? And um, the kids determined that they wanted to support a business and the guiding questions were how can we grow the business? How can we support businesses, help them target local customers, stay open, you know, be, reach out to, to local stakeholders? So that was our guiding and essential questions. Um, and, you know, thank you for bringing that up, Kristen. That was a great question. And it looks like Ramona already found a high school, uh, a high school connection. She's gonna, she said she could use this to maximize profit or minimize cost with calculus. So dig it. All right, so we're going to go on to the next uh, idea, and this one was one that um, I did a couple years ago with my kids um, that I actually want to bring back because uh, selfishly you'll see it's really helpful as a teacher. Um, maybe not something we're thinking about right now as the summer ends, but I did this unit in the spring. So every spring we had a longer spring break in CPS. I don't know how long it is in your district, but we had two weeks. Is it two weeks again this year, Ben? Uh, for spring break, you said? Yeah. No, it's, um, I think maybe it was because, um, were you on a modified? I think you guys were on yeah, a different track. Yeah, we were, we were We just have one week. Yeah, we just have, mm -hmm. we've only had one week for a while. Uh, well, now, now, I mean, one week's still like a vacation. We had this boss two-week vacation for a long time. And so, like, that was kind of my time to go crazy and go on vacation. And so I would have my kids act as travel agents. And, you know, it's, um... It's kind of ridiculous because they don't have travel agents anymore. They have, like, you know, Travelocity or whatever. But um, my kids really liked this, and they liked getting to boss me. Kids like telling, you know, the adults what to do. So I had them, I gave them some options of what I wanted to do. I said I want to go on, like, a beach vacation or whatever. Um, and again, it, with my population, my kids don't go on vacation a ton, so they helped plan mine. If your kids are able to go on their own vacation, it's really cool for them to determine, where, you know, what they would do. Um, I also have a colleague, uh, Jay Atwood, who teaches at Singapore American School, and they are um, they have the great opportunity with their resources to take their kids on a, an out-of-country field trip every year. I don't know. Have you talked to Jay about that before, Ben? I haven't, and unfortunately, my audio just cut out, so I didn't hear it. Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> they, um, Sorry about that. 
Ben, um, I'm sorry, Jay Atwood uh, at Singapore American School, their teachers take their kids on an international trip every year. Um, oh, they, they like do us. Sherpas. I know, they like go to like Everest, <laughs> not Everest, but they like, you know, they hike up there, you know, in, in the mountains in Nepal, or they go to South Africa and, mm -hmm. and learn about the apartheid, or, you know, they go to Chicago and <laughs> learn about architecture. <laughs> so um, they fly all over the world, but they, their kids plan the whole thing. Right. I mean, that whole concept of like what they're doing in the way that that planning phase in that science and that math and how it integrates just really reflects so much about the Common Core, right? So a lot of people talk about college and career readiness, but like this is the reality is that like our kids are a part of the world today. And so what can what can we do? It looks like Jay is taking his kids all around the world. And while we might not all have a jet, like using and integrating those math skills into like what it is a part of their lives right. is so important. So we've done this from any level from like, again, like my kids plans one of my vacations and I followed their directions and actually took that vacation and then reported on it when I got back. Um, some of our kids have planned the field trip, so they got to pick one local field trip at the end of the year. We give them a budget and then they determine where they're going, how to do the buses, they call the bus companies. So they might determine um, which museums that you need, they want to visit. Um, when I did mine, I, I was going to Hawaii for the very first time and they said, they researched, like they knew that I liked to hike, so they found the Haleakala Mountain and they said I should do the sunrise. Some of the kids were determining what time I need to wake up at my hotel to leave to go see the sunrise and they're like, you don't like waking up early, Miss Vigera, but this is what time you're going to say. So like they, they typed up like a whole like bossy set of directions of like what they wanted me to do. And again, like some kids might not want to do that. So we definitely had kids planning their own field trips for trips that they could take for themselves. You know, whether the museum had free tickets for students, um, how much the bus called. They were on the phone with the bus company. The bus company, we thought it was a prank call. They were like, you know, little squeaky <laughs> nine-year-old boy saying like, we have 36 kids and we need to, and they're like, um, excuse me, is there a grown-up? They're like, no, I'm doing this for project-based learning. Just tell me how much the rate is. And so, you know, I'm sitting there next to them and I'm like, no, no, I had to grab the phone at one point and be like, this is for real, please answer their questions. But the bus company loved it. They ate it up and um, they gave the kids the quote and they had to figure out like what they were going to eat for lunch and talk to the lunchroom and determine like that there was going to be enough lunch for everybody. They typed up the permission slip and got it signed by the principal. Um, so, I mean, it was really, it was really great Oops, to see how that worked. Um, and then we integrated that into all of our studies. So Lindsay Rose oops, is an amazing uh, fifth grade math teacher down in the South Shore area of Chicago. She's a friend of both Ben's and mine. Um, there's her Twitter handle, at Teach Miss Rose. And um, she decided to do something like this with her kids after talking about it with me and hearing about this. So she had them plan the buses for her field trip. But I just want you guys to see this quick video of how her kids planned it out. Oops. It's not there. I gotta grab it. Um, so Ben, I don't know if you want to chat real quick while I pull this up. Sure. Um, <laughs> do you do you want me to talk about Lindsay's project or just chat oh. in general? Oh, you know what? I found it. <laughs> All right. Well, killing time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Can you still see my screen? Is this video coming up? Yep. Okay. Is that playing? It is. Jenny? Yep. I think the video may be frozen. Oh, no. Where are you You guys? know what? It's playing just now. Okay. I'll hit play again. Let's see if that works. Is it moving for you now? It is slowly. It's a little, it's a little hesitant, but... A little laggy. Well, I'm just going to mute it and talk over it, maybe, just um, so that 
um, you guys can see it. So basically, you can see that what she did was she showed the kids the bus that they would need to take. This is um, this is the same bus that like brings some of their students who have to bus in from other neighborhoods. And um, she asked the kids, you know, what do you think? And they're like, I don't get it. And so then she had them iterate. And you notice she didn't give them a ton of support. She really said, like, think about what questions. And they realized, oh, we're going on this field trip. Let's figure it out. But then I love how she used a mix of both digital and physical manipulatives. I don't know if it froze on that part or if you got to see it. But her kids were using counters to kind of think mm -hmm. of arrays for how many kids could sit in a seat. They were measuring themselves and their their booties. Sorry, I don't know. Can I say booty on a webinar? <laughs> uh, they were measuring their booties to see like how big, how many of them could fit in a bus. Because our kids don't want ride buses to school normally. Our kids walk to school um, or take the CTA. And um, they were using screencasting apps to draw out the arrays and then determine, like, you know, what, you know, what, what was the essential question? Like, basically, how many buses do we need to get all these kids to the field trip? And we wanted as few buses as possible to spend the least amount of money. So this was a couple day uh, math project that they worked on, but and they were so much more engaged because it was based on something real. And then when the buses came up, they were cheering. They're like, "Yay, the buses!" <laughs> you know. And you like, you know, why are you so excited about the buses pulling in? But because they decided how many were coming for this trip. And then they did this whole self-assessment at the end, and they said they loved figuring it out on themselves. They got to learn it by themselves. Um, they really said that they enjoyed um, getting the, uh, using a video or using a real-world example to, to think about math um, and to be challenged. And it was really different from the way they had been learning before. So um, again, I just wanted to show that to show the, the really solid math application of a part of this um, of this project. Um, have you have you have you done anything like that with planning any trips or having your kids do anything that affects the school at all? You know, I mean, I have not actually had them plan any trips, but now I want to make them do it all because it's such a headache. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that <it> whole. <laughs> The whole concept of like budgeting and um, cost per person versus like planning in bulk and and what kind of uh, fit and receive. What was happening with the students in Lindsay's classroom was the way that they were using the manipulatives and the physical arrays, but also using that abstract uh, representation as well with the numbers and the measurements, and so like all of those pieces were sort of happening simultaneously and I bet a lot of kids were deciding and coming to some of those strategies on their own but the next question would be like well let's talk about efficiency and and which of these strategies helped us to like make these decisions and I think what ends up coming about in a project-based learning experiences like this is that the strategies have to work in concert and yeah. and that all of them work together so that they can get into their end goal. So that's that's remarkable. I'm inspired yeah. by her. <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing, again, is like, <laughs> you're solving a problem for yourself, too. Like, the field trip part is, so, you're right, it's such a headache. I love having my kids do it. Um, so the next one that I want to share, and really quick, Nancy, I know that you asked about the planning of all of this, and we're going to hit the planning at the end, so stay tuned. Um, don't worry, we're going to talk about how you plan all of this and how you assess it. And then Michelle, before we go on, Michelle had asked about if you don't have iMovie. Um, earlier we talked about having kids create trailers. Uh, if you don't have iMovie, the next best thing is WeVideo, which is a free video. It's definitely no, it ain't no iMovie, but it's pretty good, it's free. WeVideo.com, it works both on Android and Chrome, um, so if you don't have an Apple product, you can definitely make an, a Wee video. Um, so check that out, WeVideo.com. But um, the next one that we want to talk about is um, the science all around us, and this was, again, this was probably like, I think this might have been the very first PBL I've ever done, and you can see it's going to, it's kind of like PBL light. And so, um, Basically, here's our school at 55 West Thurmack, and our building, um, National Teachers Academy, is pretty new looking. Ben's been there. People get there, and the first thing they say is, oh, you have a really nice building. And we're like, well, what so about nice. our teaching? Yeah. <laughs> um, like, oh, we do other things well, too. So here's a, here's a picture of it. You can see it's like a big, brand new brick building. It doesn't look like your average CPS school. We have an indoor pool. Um, elementary school. Elementary yeah. school, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, we're a pre-K-8. So it's, it's a nice building. Um, and with that being said, we also have an amazing engineer staff who takes really good care of it because, you know, being in Chicago in the winter, you get like all of this, like all the snow and the cracking. And so it's really easy to see all the weathering that's happening to our building. And we really want to take care of our building. We also, um, I don't know if it's hard to see this, but we have this little... Um, sky bridge that connects this is the park district building to our main building this all the classes are in the big tall side and then this little short guy on the other side is the pool and the gym and then there's this like glass sky bridge and every single spring it's uh, a bird cemetery because <laughs> all those oh. poor poor little birdies can't see that it's glass and they slam into it and then fall and die underneath um, and so there's, there was cracking in here and there were dead birds. So we were trying to think about how to make our building more eco-friendly and have less of an of a, um, impact on the environment because the kid, it was, obviously it's really disturbing. You, you, doesn't even, you don't even have to be a fifth grader to be disturbed by all the dead mm. bird carcasses Quite from the nice. glass. <laughs> right. So the kids had to determine what they could do to the building to make it um, more green and more not just more green in terms of our energy consumption but in terms of our impact in our environment so they started with a uh, google earth view of the of the um, school and they ha tried to see like how much green space we were killing um, and how much we were taking up and they learned about like how much you know oxygen plants emit and what they could do they talked about doing a garden there's a little space back here where you can create a garden they also went around the building and looked for signs of physical and chemical lost. weathering. I oh. lost your audio again. Will you go ahead and say that again? Oh, yeah, Starting yeah. With, uh, looking at the green space. Oh, yeah, they were looking at the green space to see how much of a footprint our building was taking up and how, much, um, how many plants we killed, basically, to build this building. Um, you know, how, what they could do to counteract that, like by planting trees or by creating a, a school garden. Um, and then they took their iPads and they went around outside and they took pictures of physical and chemical weathering um, as a result of either just the concrete or, or um, you know, rust coming off of different parts of our building. They looked at trees that were trying to grow and might not have been able to. You know how, um, you know, you can see their, their roots popping up through the concrete. Um, they were looking at plants that were trying to rebirth in the middle of the concrete slabs and they were pinning it using um, Google Maps Engine Light wasn't out then yet we were just using Google Maps but now they would use Google Maps Engine Light and they went around and pinned you can drop pins using Google Maps Engine with different things so they were adding the images of physical and chemical weathering of areas that they thought could be replanted or reseeded for plants and then created this interactive maps with opportunities to go green and opportunities um, and areas that we were impacting our environment and so it was an interactive map that you can move around and then they also use um, an app called Erasma Light um, ben, have you played with this one? I have. I love, I love Erasma. It's awesome. Do you want to quickly tell them what augmented reality is? Uh, sure. So basically, it's the future, and <laughs> <laughs> um, augmented reality is sort of like at least my exposure to it is about um, using something that is seemingly two dimensional, like your screen, either your iPad or your iPhone, or um, I guess that's very Apple device heavy. Uh, uh, one of the, one of these devices that can use augmented reality, and someone else will have created some sort of overlay um, that only picks up when you get into that like geographic location. And so, uh, when you take your camera and you scan it, like in in your screenshot that you're showing now, um, the the is that the Big Ben Tower? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Suddenly, someone has infused and added in, uh, you know. Godzilla, or no, not Godzilla. Like King uh, Kong, maybe? King Kong, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, different, so, different monster. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely it can be used for art in this way, or you can like geotag uh, other elements that, that might be more practical, like a scientist might. Um, I'm assuming, I'm just envisioning at this point that like once you come to that concrete that's weathered in that way, uh, if you use that augmented reality, you could show like what could be overlaid on top of it. Could you design this into a basketball court or, or what would a garden look like in this um, place? And so you can sort of
Oh, we lost you a minute for there. But yeah, I think you're saying so exactly. And we also had um, what what didn't happen that year, but we're hoping to do this year actually, is to do this project again with a new cohort of fourth and fifth graders, but to partner with a high school chemistry teacher, because there's a high school that we have down the street, Phillips, and um, have those kids make 3D renderings of the, um, what the molecular, molecular structure of rust looks like and what's happening there um, chemically. And so uh, our kids could go and, and scan or like use their iPad or Android device to look at rust on our building. And what would pop up is um, so a creation, a digital creation that one of the high schoolers did to look at the rust and explain what's happening. Um, so the auras really turn your environment into a three-dimensional digital bulletin board, basically. And all of the things that they're scanning um, show, uh, show student work, um, show you know, either a little video they've created, a presentation, a document. Um, you're right, like a layout of, of a green space that they could build to explain um, what could go there instead. So they're creating this interactive um, you know, map with um, with all of these images, but also auras. And the map also pins where you can find the Erasmus, because unlike a QR code, which has a little tag on it, the auras, like you'd have to put a sticker or something to show that there's an aura there. And we, we didn't want to put stickers all over our neighborhood, because that was counterintuitive to trying to make the neighborhood more green, right? Let's not put <laughs> garbage everywhere. So instead, we had little pins where you could find where the auras are. And, um, Another high school on the north side of Chicago is going to do something similar, not about the green space, but about cataloging the, the elements you can find in their building. And the, they're going to create a three-dimensional periodic table of elements throughout their building. And they're going to try and identify how many elements they can find in their building, and then have the kids develop um, 3D models and renderings of what that is so that you could scan through the building and tag all of that. So I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do with these ideas. How long do those auras stick around for? Do you, are they time stamped? I don't think so. I think that they're there forever until you forever. like delete them. So or until like the the technology <laughs> you know evolves and they don't they don't run. I actually would be interested to go back and see if they're still there. I haven't checked. Yeah, I mean that seems like a, a really interesting way for kids to um, impact and and go public in a way that extends over time b yeah. beyond what a bulletin board could ever do. How cool would it be if you like, you know, we're all grown up, you know, and you bring your kids back to your old elementary school and you pull out a device and you can scan and still find <laughs> the video you made when you were in fourth grade. That would be so cool. That would be really cool. Um, so speaking of impacting our world and coming back and seeing your, you know, your social footprint, Ben, you want to talk to us about what your project was? Sure. So I... Um, it, every week we have class meetings in sixth grade. Mostly, uh, you know, if I am able to devote 45 minutes a week to um, listening to the students' problems as adolescents, you know, those 12-year-olds, 11 and 12-year-olds have a lot going on in their heads, uh, and it's it's a good opportunity for them to be able to talk about the challenges they're facing, so that they can understand that they're not alone in it, and also that so that they can um, build and, and help each other out. But all that being said, uh, our class meetings were a little depressing sometimes because they were so focused on the negative. And so what we wanted to do uh, Jenny, can you hear me? Oh, yep, sorry. I think I lost you or you lost me right there for a minute. Okay, no worries. Um, will you go to the next slide for me? Yep, sure. Okay, great. So. Um, what we wanted to do was, um, what I wanted to do after attending this this uh, sort of conference uh, was think about what my students could do to be upstanders. And so uh, in order to get them to be better researchers and to, to access information that seems relevant to them, like we really focus on identifying keywords that they could look for before they're coming up with search terms. And so before school started, I just kind of started this spreadsheet. And um, when I use the Google uh, spreadsheets, I like to sp split it up by last name A through L and then um, M through Z just so that not everyone's in one sheet because it gets it sort of lags a little bit at that point. And so um, my idea was just to get kids to be card-carrying members of different organizations. And so when I first started out, um, I noticed that there was, I, I, what I thought was that they'd identify global organizations, local organizations, and environmental organizations. 
And so we started, um, and you can see sort of the revision history in the right-hand column, and um, we started about um, like 850, uh, which is, is about when we run our uh, class meetings. And the kids right away said to me, they're like, oh, no, we need to come up with organizations that help kids and that have disaster relief. Because uh, the week prior, there was that huge tsunami um, in the Philippines. And so that was what was relevant for them. And they wanted to know about relief organizations and uh, what, what kinds of things they could do to get involved. And that's the power, right? That's the beauty of, of them having that opportunity. So next slide. Um, and so then what students were able to do in all the different colors on the screens here, uh, you'll see that after seven minutes, students were all working simultaneously, all having an active voice, collaborating together. You can see that homeless shelters and helping animals sort of transpired um, during this, this one, um, this brief two-minute period. Um, the kids were adding in all these different organizations and uh, coming up with a lot of like ways to research effectively and and, and to collaborate together. Next slide. And then, you know, 15 minutes after that, we were done. And this is what they <laughs> came up with, uh, with a lot of students, you know, just copying and pasting links of those organizations, um, some just listing the titles. And, and in 15 minutes with uh, the community meeting that we had, it didn't take a big piece of my day, um, but I was just so inspired by what kids found interesting. You know, I thought they'd go to like the World Wildlife Foundation and the Red Cross, things that were really um, well known and modern, but they found so many local organizations and, and uh, environmental organizations especially. Kids are obsessed with uh, animals and their environment in sixth grade. Polar bears are like their biggest bleeding heart cause. Uh, so it's it. I I never could have planned this for them, right? Like, what organizations might be interesting to them? So, the next week, um, I I took all of this data and sort of aggregated it and um, took it the other spreadsheet and brought them together um, into their categories. And uh, if you want to go to the next slide, um, ask the kids to think for themselves. Like, all right, so. What's the purpose of the organization? What volunteer opportunities are there? Um, how do you get, what membership is there? Is it a global or local group? Like can a, a Burley student become a card carrying member? There's a lot of, of value and benefit in recognizing what sort of advocacy organizations out there they can become a part of later in life, but um, it'd be great if they, you know, if they found organizations that they can be part of today. And so um, kids were doing such authentic, informational reading in, in this in this venture. They were navigating these communities' websites and um, having to really dig in and find out information. Uh, if the information wasn't available, then they had to like contact and communicate effectively with these other groups so that they could could uh, get some of this information. And so I think the benefit from for this for me is that like whenever you're working with some of these like problems problem-based or project-based learning experiences that you think about like what's the relevance to these kids? Is it significant? Is it going to impact them? Is it authentic? Isn't that what we do when we want to know like where do I donate my money or where do I spend my time? Uh, this is what I would do myself but like not as well as they did it. I did it way better. I'm like oh man I got to get a part of this organization and this is part of the organization. Um, but the last piece and you know it's not necessarily um, a, a part of any standard but like a middle schooler needs their heart to grow as well. And, and that sort of social emotional piece is something that like can't be um, you know undervalued. It's it's just amazing to see like the way that the students walk away with that experience, knowing that like they have to infuse. Yesterday, of a high school that talked about like school is there for kids' passion and and for kids' aspirations, and so um, I really loved that this project helped them to engage in that. So um, one of the things that I'm wondering is, you know, what was the follow-up? You know, so today, you, you know, if the kids are still working with any of these, or you know, do you think that this had a lasting impact in their, in their, um, their interaction with these organizations? Yeah, um, it was just, you know, of course, it has, it, like anything, it has varying levels of um, impact with them. But there were definitely students who were going and volunteering at Gigi's Playhouse, which is. Um, a local organization for students with Down syndrome and um, they were volunteering their time there and creating relationships with kids that they might not have ever 
um, taken the time to to know about not because they didn't have the time but because they didn't um, they didn't know about it and so through that exposure they were able to get engaged with that and then again I talked about um, I can't remember what that hurricane was Tyan or Haiyan something like that um, that disaster relief in the Philippines we had uh, a student in our class who was Filipino and so like he saw that reflection of himself in his school day which you know, it's so important for our kids to be able to see themselves in the learning that they do. And so he felt that value and that intrinsic value. But then for other kids, uh, they saw it as a window and an opportunity to, to engage in, in cultures and uh, that weren't necessarily their own. And so throughout the school year, we revisited, revisited his culture a lot, a lot more than I think we would have had we not engaged in this. So it definitely became a part of like casual conversation, but um, also in changing sort of what they were doing and um, the rest of our community meetings definitely were a lot more positive focused on like what can we do to be an upstander to get out in our community and create positive social change. I love this. I mean, I, I think you hear that so many times. I mean, you know, we just talked recently about, again, Lindsay's class and how they feel there's such a negative stigma with their neighborhood. And instead mm -hmm. of focusing on the negative narrative, trying to figure out what can you do to change that narrative is so powerful. And usually you don't engage kids as young as, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade in that, but they definitely can. Even we've had our kindergartners talk about it. So that's awesome, Ben. Um, so I'm going to skip this one. We talked about, there was one where we, we created an app, but um, looking at the time, I think I'm going to move past this. One thing I do want to share with you, though, is this, uh, this website, Trello.com. It's a free project management site that's really incredible. Um, just I'm going to show you really briefly because we don't have a ton of time. Um, but Trello is free. You can sign up uh, with any account, or you can just link your uh, Google Apps account if you have one of those guys. Um, so I have a Google Apps account, so I'm just going to click log in with Google because I'm already logged into this web window. And you can see I have all these different projects going on. Um, but one of the projects that my students did was you know, building a video game or an app this year. And they can create these lists, and these lists can have um, any title. So what they did was they scaffolded out the different sides of it. So they had to do goals. So like they had to, they, you can see they added all these different goals, ideas. They can do uh, different things for game design. Who is the target audience? They're adding a different card for that. These could be to-do lists. They could be projects. So they could, each of these could be their own project. But if you click on one of these, it turns over, and you can have a chat about it. You can create due dates. You can add checklists to it. Um, so I could say, you know, on the checklist, I could say, um, uh, make um, a character. Um, and then I could say, um, create a storyline. All right, I'm not going to do too much with this. But then, um, oops. But then if I check something off, you can see there's a little a little um, progress bar. Oh, but on the on the sure. front, it also has like the one out of two. It shows you like how much you've got done. It tells you how many chats. You can also vote on the different things. I could vote I like that idea, and you can see that is up to two votes. I can vote on any of these guys. This is a this is a copy, so don't worry. I'm not messing with this kid's project. We made a copy <laughs> to share. But these little icons, here's Shayla, here's Trinity, you can drag um, their little faces off to the side here and then add them to a card and then they get all the updates to the card um, and they get email reminders that they should work on it. And then on the back of the card you can also attach Google Docs um, and present all that sort of good stuff too. Um, so it's, it's really powerful. I really love this in terms of project management when you're doing project-based learning, and it also helps keeping kids accountable so that they do their work and you can see what they're working on. Um, so that's Trello.com, and it's free. It's so easy to use. And all these cards drag. So I can say, oh, you know what? I think this actually goes here. I can move it back. Um, so That looks really amazing, Jenny. It seems like, especially for those students with executive functioning um, issues, like the that ability to always have that in real time wherever they're at and as a web-based tool is really cool. Yeah, and even beyond project-based learning, we use this for writer's workshops. So we do draft um, or brainstorm, draft, revise, edit, publish, and as they're working on their different writing, they just move the card to which side, part of the writer's workshop they're on. And if you turn it over, you can see activity and comments, like to-do list with that draft, you know, who's their peer editor, all that good stuff. Um, but anyway, that's Trello. So I just wanted to share that with you quickly. Oh. But um, 
The last thing um, I wanted to share, Nancy had questions about planning. We had several people ask about how to do this without technology and then how to add the standards. So I'm going to show one last project-based learning unit to kind of get all that with in. Um, so um, uh, back, uh oh, I don't even know what my website is. There it goes. <laughs> um, teaching like it's 29, is that my website? Teaching like it's 2999.com? Hmm. That's weird. <laughs> Let me try going to go. I don't. I don't know my own website. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Is that my website? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was. Teaching okay, there it like goes. It's, yeah. Okay, I don't know what I did wrong. So I'm just going to go ahead and write here PBL. Um, maybe I call it CBL. So um, on my website, I have um, kind of this is. Uh, when I really had to rethink about challenge-based learning. And this was about equalizing our education. It was about getting in, oh, there was a strike in Chicago a couple of years ago, I don't know if you guys heard, but our kids were really digging into that and, and trying to figure out um, how they could make their, their world better. And they decided to create a grant to improve their school. So um, what I did was I had them embark on um, this challenge-based learning unit to rethink what they were doing. And um, it, it was it was kind of bumpy, but my questions were a lot about um, what what I hear you asking about as well. You know, how am I going to keep my kids accountable? How am I going to plan it? How am I going to make sure yeah. that um, that you know if someone comes into my classroom, they're not saying like, oh my god, what have you been doing for the past couple <laughs> weeks? Are you teaching? I was a and I was a math teacher, um, so. I, I wasn't a self-contained teacher where I um, where I taught every single thing. I had to show how I was hitting the Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, you know, expectations, the Illinois state standards, and actually, um, and actually, the um, sorry, and actually the Common Core standards too, because that was coming out. So here's my lesson plan. Um, sorry, this is what I was looking for. So you can see I have a unit summary up at the top. Are you able to see this, Ben? Is this coming out for you on your screen? Yep. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So, yeah, um, just a little bit. That'd be great. Like a little bit bigger, uh, but. Oh, okay. I'll just zoom in just a bit. Um, so we have, you know, my essential questions, guiding questions, big idea. This should look really similar to anyone who's done understanding by design, UB, um, UBD, it, or backwards design. It's really similar. And the only thing I added was the challenge, right? So then you can see here I have all my Common Core State standards that I hit um, and my ICANN statements because that's how we do it in elementary school. <laughs> Actually, I think some high schools do, like students will be able to. So I had all of these out. These were the ones that I had to hit that unit. So I had to really think about how I was going to pull them in. I've got my summative assessments. Um, but each day I um, had, it started kind of with a question. So every day I would start with a guiding question and then I'd have an activity where the kids would dig into it. And there were days where there was some direct instruction. Like my students didn't really understand rates yet and they really needed rates to think about how they were going to be purchasing some of the different items for their, um, for their uh, project, for their grant. So I had a, a day, you'll see in here, where I taught, I taught rates. It wasn't every day, it was just explore, free time. We had to have some structured direct instruction. And I don't know, uh, Ben, how, you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I absolutely, well, I think that's really important because um, it sort of shifts the idea of being like an after school club activity to like engaging in the curriculum and that kids not only want but need um, some of that direct instruction as well. So the way that you can infuse that I think is really important, especially like you were saying, in this math, like what kinds of things do we get, do we need to know? Well, rates becomes a part of it. That seems really relevant to us. Or um, are we going to um, make sense of this problem by like reading graphs and in in which ways in which ways will the graphs when they go public with their knowledge help present uh, their knowledge the most? They're going to need to know how do I design and set up that histogram versus that box and whisker plot because since I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, if you think about it, like with any you know project or any kind of skill, you need you need the the hard skills before you can get at the soft skills, right? So if we're going to build a boat, they need to know how to like cut wood and you know hammer the nails in and measure. So we have days where we teach them the skills, the hard skills and strategies that they need. But then we give them. I think the difference between this and just teaching the lessons and giving them worksheets is the output is always authentic. It's leading to something, so they know why they're learning about rates. So I'm not saying to them, we're learning about rates because we're on chapter seven, and the title of chapter seven is rates. Um, it's we're learning about rates because 
you're going to have to think about which, you know, uh, we're going to be buying these things for our, our, our brand and you want to get the cheapest one and you're going to have to understand rates to find the cheapest rate of whatever. Um, so the kids have this, they're really bought in more to learning it and figuring it out because they know why they need to know it, um, which is really important. Um, so Nancy, for your question about planning and for others who I noticed were asking about standards, uh, we kind of come up, for my kids at least, we come up with our essential question first and then my fun job as a teacher is figuring out how we're going to hit the standards through that question. So I might add in, you know, like we, you know, for grant building, we need to hit rates so I want them to actually think about unit rates for things instead of just finding cheap cheap whatever. I might have them think about gas or think about something that includes rates and I might kind of force it around this corner to get us into that. But um, the driving force is the question, the curiosity, rather than the content. And I think it, I found now, um, I think this is the fourth year we're digging into project-based learning, um, it's, it's a lot easier to start than way, that way. It's a lot harder to fake curiosity. Um, it's a lot easier to find mm. out what they're curious about and then infuse the learning into that. Yeah, oh my gosh, Jenny, that's so, <laughs> that was so spot on. Just that idea of, of um, making the math and figuring out how math can apply to our everyday life, like that's our job as educators, but we can't necessarily make them passionate about their world, so starting with their passions is really important. Like I know that some of my students um, this past year were so curious to know more and more about uh, the waste and trash that we were using, um, specifically because we uh, wanted to create a better recycling program in our school. And so we looked at the difference between volume and surface area in a really authentic way. And of course it required talking about these different formulas and ways that we can apply them. And uh, then the students were able to sort of go out and, and look at the products that they personally use. Like how is this personal bag of chips different from this personal bag or this water bottle from uh, this other container. And so that, that curiosity and passion does work much better later. Um, and one last thing, because we only were actually right at the, the hour mark. Um, someone else was asking about non-digital. And what's really great about project-based learning is it's not about the technology. The technology is a great enhancer. Obviously, you heard from Ben and I, from Trello boards to Google Drive to augmented reality. It allows for your kids to create much more in-depth and powerful examples. But there's, you don't have to have technology to do project-based learning. I mean, then, I mean, tell, you want to tell them about the lotion project that your kids are working on? <laughs> sure. So uh, a student wanted to uh, sort of be an innovator, and something that she's passionate about is uh, chapstick and makeup and fashion and all of that. And so she wanted to design her own uh, chapstick that... Uh, required her to use a lot of experimentation. What will happen if I take the Vaseline uh, and first melt it in the crock pot and how long can I melt it in the crock pot so that it contains this viscosity and uh, what sort of combinations of uh, Kool-Aid and other materials can I embed into these products so that like they become functional while still, while still aesthetically beautiful. And so none of that required anything but, I guess, her bringing in that crock pot and some of those other uh, materials. And yeah, and so I mean, I think that it's really just about getting your, giving your kids the opportunity to explore, giving them the opportunity to ask questions, and then starting from where they're at. So I know that we're at a time, so I just want to give you one last thing to check out. Challengebasedlearning.org is a really great site to really help you scaffold and to think about these things. It's where I went when I really was digging into it for the first time. Um, there's great videos, there's cool stuff from it. I don't know if you watch Mythbusters, but um, they have a cool little trailer to get you geeked up and to kind of sell your PLC or your, um, your school on the idea. Um, great templates, how-to, starting guides, um, sample lessons. Uh, really, really great stuff. So challengebasedlearning.org. Again, challenge-based, project-based, problem-based. We're all talking about the same thing here. It's about <laughs> letting your kids learn by leading with curiosity. So um, sorry we're out of time, guys. Hope this was helpful for you. Doug and the McGraw-Hill team are going to be archiving this whole webinar on YouTube, I believe, um, but online. And they're going to send something out in a little bit. So Doug, um, I'm, well, first, Ben, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time and sharing your great thinking. Um, Absolutely. I enjoyed learning from your kids. It was awesome. And uh, Doug, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Jenny. And Ben, uh, I echo what Jenny says. Thank you so much.
much for joining us, Jenny. Always a pleasure as, uh, as well. Um, uh, thanks for all the great ideas and and and, and helping out all the fellow educators out there. Um, we're, we're really excited to be able to present this to you. Um, uh, we really appreciate everyone's time today. And, and as Jenny says, we're going to be archiving this session and on YouTube, and we'll be sending you guys the link to that. Um, if anybody has any questions uh, uh, for Jenny or Ben that they want to they want to route our way, um, you can email us at webinars at mheducation.com and we'll be happy to, to help address or answer any questions you guys have. Um, again, thanks everybody and uh, Jenny and Ben, thank you. Uh, we look forward to working with you again. Thank you.